when people refer to bodybuilding, what they most people mean is just getting bigger, mm. um, you know, having a, a better, uh, more developed physique, but not necessarily worrying about the symmetry between their biceps and their calves or, you know, whether they have shredded, you know, glute ham tie ins and that sort of thing. Like they're not necessarily looking to take it to that level. Just like a lot of the people that we train want to get stronger. Mm. They're not necessarily interested in powerlifting, mm. you know, and that's, that's two, that's two different things as well. They're strength training and then they're powerlifting. Hey guys, welcome. We're here with our buddy Andy Baker. Today is an important day for those of you that are interested in how to get big and strong because Andy quite literally co-authored the book on this stuff. So Andy has made a bunch of contributions to what we do here. So he co-authored Practical Programming with Mark Ripito. If you haven't read that, you have to check that out. That is uh, the Bible on how to program for strength training. Um, Andy also is the first guy to do a starting strength style gym in retail. So what he built kind of inspired the franchise model, and here we are today. So Andy, thanks, man, for being a trailblazer um, and for all your contributions. Welcome to the show. I thought we would uh, probably piss some people off, hopefully clear up some confusion, and uh, sure. ex explain things as well as we understand them, admitting that we don't understand everything, which is, which is part of the problem. So Absolutely. Um, Appreciate you having me on. Yeah, man. So why don't we start with definitions? Can you... Because in the in the way of of everything we do, I think the names are all fucked up. You know, I don't I don't think bodybuilding actually is bodybuilding. I think bodybuilding is like body sculpting, but I think strength training is bodybuilding. Because what builds your body, right? I'm up eighty right. pounds, so is that bodybuilding? Yeah. So, anyways, I you know the definitions are screwy. It's kind of like powerlifting. There are no power moves in the in in powerlifting. It should be strength lifting, um, and Olympic lifting could be powerlifting. So the the definitions are screwed up, but what, what are the definitions as far as you're concerned when it comes to the things that affect size and strength? So you've got strength training, bodybuilding, what, what else is relevant and what's your take on what they mean? Yeah. Well, there's obviously within all of those things, there's broad overlap between all of them. So the, the differences are, I would say on the margins, but they're, they're, the, the, there's, there's more commonalities than there are differences. I would say, um, you know, strength training is a part of all of these more specific endeavors. I kind of link, like we were talking about just a second ago, but kind of before we got on air, it's like, like bodybuilding is a sport. It's a very specific thing. It's based on looking a certain way in a certain, in a certain set of poses. So it's not even just being big and muscular. It's being symmetrical. It's being big. It's being conditioned. It's all of those things in a, in a competitive environment, according to a certain set of rules. There's a very, very narrow subset of people that actually want to engage in actual competitive bodybuilding. And like kind of what you were saying is true. It's like at the higher levels of bodybuilding, it's, it's more about everybody's big and everybody's muscular. So there's, it comes down to one genetics because that's going to by and large determine the, the, the shape and the symmetry and all that kind of stuff, you know? And so that's like, if you have high insertions on your calves, like you're not going to have big giant calves that are symmetrical to your arms if you've got, you know, genetically superior arms. But the thing is in bodybuilding, like that matters, like the symmetry between certain body parts and all that sort of thing. So like that's a, but so genetics determine how, in a way how far you can go, but then it comes down to at the highest level, it, it's more of a fat loss contest and a water reduction contest than it is about necessarily muscle size. Because if you look at, if you look on stage at the top guys, they're all big, mm -hmm. they're all muscular. Mm -hmm. Some guys come in really, 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 really hard and in condition and some guys less so. And so it, it becomes almost more of a, a water manipulation, fat loss conditioning contest at the very end than it does necessarily a size contest because mm -hmm. they're all, you know, they're all pretty much big. So mm -hmm. that, but that, that aspect of it is not generally what most people are interested in. Um, 
when people refer to bodybuilding kind of, uh, let's say like lowercase V, what they, what they, most people mean is just getting bigger, mm. um, you know, having a, a better, uh, more developed physique, but not necessarily worrying about the symmetry between their biceps and their calves or, you know, whether they have shredded, you know, glute ham tie-ins and that sort of thing. Like they're not necessarily looking to take it to that level. Just like a lot of the people that we train want to get stronger. Mm. They're not necessarily interested in powerlifting, mm -hmm. you know, and that's, that's two, that's two different things as well. There's strength training and then there's powerlifting. Mm -hmm. Powerlifting is a certain it's yes, it's squat bench and deadlifts. So it's very similar to what we would do say strength training, just more in a general sense, but there's a, a subset of rules there that have to be adhere to which makes it the competitive sport mm. um and so it's it's a little bit different it's not exact strength training and powerlifting obviously there's broad overlap you know the way that um you know someone might train that's just interested in generally being strong is going to be very similar to maybe somebody who's a competitive powerlifter but maybe not exactly the same mm. i think powerlifting has a lot more probably a lot more interest just because it's more accessible mm -hmm. you know it's just it's easier for the regular guy with a regular job and kids and whatever to do a powerlifting meet on occasion than it is to get into the bodybuilding world. Because if you know people that are in, into bodybuilding, that sort of thing, it's, um, you know, it's all consuming. It's, it's, it's a, a 24 set because it's, it's a full-time job. Mm -hmm. It's a very, very self, I mean, and they'll tell you that it's a very, very self-absorbed, self-centered thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and by and large, it's not really the training, it's the diet and all that sort of thing. It's just, it just makes it to where most regular people, um, don't necessarily want to take it to that, to that link. There, there's this funny meme that floats around the internet. I see on occasion always cracks me up. It's like, what's the difference between powerlifting and bodybuilding? And it's like, well, powerlifting is basically bodybuilding without all the dietary discipline. <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> you know, and that's, and so people are like, son of a bitch, I'm in like, you know, so it's, it's like, there's, it's not exactly true, but there's definitely some truth to that. Sure. And, and it's for guys like me, I'm, I'm a pretty genetically average. And, uh, if I want to get big and strong, the way to do that is three days a week with the compound movements, adding a little bit of weight each time. And I know that for sure, because I tried everything else before doing starting strength. I was a guy at 24 hour fitness doing bicep curls and all this other shit. And nothing was changing. And actually, that's the reason I wanted to have you on today, because you, you popped into my head when I was at the gym about two weeks ago. So what's happening with me is, I don't know if you're aware, but I'm still recovering from this neck surgery, right? And okay. I am losing my mind with boredom, doing the same old right. shit, super light, because I can't push myself right now because of my neck. So I'm actually, uh, Will Morris has me on some bodybuilding stuff, just for fun. Right. And I've learned a couple things throughout this process, and it's really interesting. It's, it's really interesting because... Not much has changed since I was 19 years old doing this shit in the gym and running in circles. And, and what I mean by that is I was at the gym the other day, a commercial gym in front of the dumbbell rack, and I'm learning some kind of bicep curl. I think it's the, the one where you, you, know, you go up, and then you turn your hands around, then you go back down nice and slow. And some kid who I later found out was you know 18 or 19, I forgot what he said, comes up to me and goes, hey man, can you teach me how to do these flies? I was like, not really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. I said, all this right. stuff's new to me. I'm a barbell guy. If you want to learn how to squat, I can teach you how to squat. Um, right. And I go, but hey, that guy, there was some guy who was, you know, clearly on lots of stuff and trains every day and wearing the, you know, the skimpy shirt. And he was, he was, sure. he was very, uh, very vascular and, and striated. So ask that guy. Right. Um, yeah. The guy then with his buddy approached me later in the bathroom and it was, it was kind of adorable. The guy was just like, um, uh, don't know how to say this. And we're just we're, we're like two guys in the bathroom. We're like, oh man. And he goes, uh, I, you just seem like the guy to ask, like that might, that might know, like, what, sh what should I do? You know? And, and so I think this guy represents young men in gyms all over the world. And what I want to do on this podcast is give these people a very clear plan of this is what you need to do if you want to improve your physique, because young men get into this for physique purposes. You know, the benefits of sure. strength um, other than physique uh, certainly apply when you're into sports when you're young. But as far as all the health stuff is concerned, you don't really have an appreciation for that until you're older and in pain and yeah. having to deal with health issues, right? So let's tell these guys, let's give this guy some advice. Let's tell him exactly what to do. Um, and I think our audience well, will kind of generally know the, the solution here, but I want to hear from your point of view, Andy. What's... Um, what is a young man in the gym who's been fucking around and not making any progress who wants to improve his physique? What, what does he do? Well, there it's like, it's like a lot, it's like a lot of different things. Like one, the, 
when you look at when we talk about strength as the basis for all other physical activities. So we talk about the so let's get away from the bodybuilding part of it and look at some other some other activities that kind of make the case. When you talk about a kid, a young kid that um, you know plays sports and he wants to get faster, should he train sprints on the track? Yeah, he should. But what's but what is going to really move that needle from the, the weak kid that you know, wants to get better at track, say the hundred meter or whatever, you know, when he squats 95, 135 as a freshman, what's going to be one of the main things that's going to improve his time? What, what is trainable, um, you know, other than learning the technique of how to sprint and all that sort of thing, it's getting stronger. Force that's what we tell people all the time, yep. get, get strong and, and play your sport. And so, you know, and that applies to lots of different things. It applies to sports, track and field sports. It, it, it's when you're, when you're weak and you're underdeveloped, um, you lack the, you lack the ability to produce force. You lack muscle mass. The best thing that you can do is to close that gap is to improve the, is to build a, build a relevant muscle mass and improve your a body's ability to produce force, continue to play and practice your sport. And you will get better at playing and practicing your sport. That applies to, like I said, track and field. It applies to the field, the sports of, you know, whether it's football or baseball or whatever, you know, you want to hit the ball further. You're, you're an you know, 135 squatter and a 95 bencher, bring all those numbers up and continue to practice and play baseball. And guess what you're going to do? You're going to throw harder. You're going to run the base passes path faster. You're going to hit the ball harder. You're going to hit it further. So that applies to those sports. It applies to, you know, a little closer to what we do, say Olympic weightlifting. You know, that's one of, if, for a, for a, a novice, let's say a, a beginner and he's got his eye on you know, I, it's someday I want to compete in Olympic weightlifting and, you know, maybe even compete at a high level in it, but he's an novice, he's a beginner, you know, should he practice the Olympic lifts as a beginner? Yeah, he should. But in what proportion to building his ability to produce force with squatting, deadlifting, pressing, that sort of thing, build the muscle mass, build the strength, practice a little bit of the sport to keep the skill development up. But at, at, at that point in his career, it's not his tech. It's not his technical expertise on the clean and jerk and the snatch that are going to keep him from being, you know, competing at a high level. It's the, the fact that he lacks muscle mass and he lacks the ability to produce force. And so he needs to train in a more general sense rather than getting hyper specific right away. Say with CrossFit, there's a lot of this audience that's familiar with CrossFit. You know, what's, what's the best, who are the best CrossFitters? The, generally the guys that came into CrossFit already strong, mm-hmm. And then what did they do? Then they, they learn the specifics of the gymnastic stuff and the, you know, whatever, I don't even keep up with it anymore, but whatever it is that they do in competition, the stronger you are, the, the easier the transition you're going to have into doing, you know, that thing. So um, bodybuilding is kind of the same way. If you can get stronger first on the basics, it makes a much more easier transition into a slightly more specific way of training. Um, that would make you, let's say, if you wanted to compete in bodybuilding, would make you a competitive bodybuilder. I always like, and I always tell my audience, um, it, it's like it's like higher education, right? Like when you when you start with your education, it's broad in general. You know, when you go to through high school, it's a broad in general. Well, it used to be, not so much anymore, but it's a, it's a broad <laughs> in general education. You just read, write, math, science, history you know, and you're kind of developing that base, you get into college. Mm. And then what do you do? What's the first two years? It's still kind of broad in general, right? Mm. You still got to go through, it's maybe it's a little more advanced now. It's a little faster pace, but you're still English history, the basic sciences, you know, that sort of thing with maybe a little bit of focus now on your major, Mm. you know, so if you're, if you're majoring in chemistry, you know, you might have a, you know, or whatever it is, you have a a few classes, you know, that are more tailored to you specifically, but by and large, your education is still general and you're still learning not just the material, but you're also learning a lot of the skills that you need, um, say to how to study and that sort of thing. Um, you know, you can liken it to this of how to eat, you know, properly, you know, but you're learning some very general, some very general skills. And then what happens? You get, you know, later into your undergraduate degree, you get a little bit more specific, you get into a master's program, you get into a PhD program. Now, all that you do is specific. You're beyond all of the general stuff. Um, you still got to maintain it, right? I mean, you still got to be able to read at a high level and compute math at a high level and whatever it is. It, but the focus, the focus of your studies at that time is going to be speci- almost exclusively specific on what it is that your, whatever your degree plan is. So it's the same, it's the same thing with 
whether it's powerlifting or bodybuilding or whatever, you're going to start with a more general base. And the further along you advance, the more specific you're going to have to get to that goal. And also the more individualized mm. that it will become, you know, just like in bodybuilding, you know, in some, you'll find that as you progress, all, if you're, if even whether you're genetically average or genetically gifted, you're still going to have say areas of your body that are genetically predisposed to grow faster than others. Mm -hmm. You know, I, there's guys I know that have just gigantic, huge, you know, whatever, they look like Christmas hams for calves and they don't train them. Just normal. Yeah. You know, so that's, yeah, it's, yeah. It, you know, and a lot of that's just genetic. Not everybody is going to respond that way. There's guys with, you know, whether it's, you know, your arms or whatever. So, so some of that is, some of that is just genetics for whatever reason, certain muscle groups are going to grow better than others. Some of it's just the way that we're structured mm. so that when you do a certain movement, a certain area of that body is going to receive a, a bulk of the stress relative to another part. So I was liking it to like, you know, low bar squatting for me, I got bigger, but when I got bigger, it was mainly like glutes and adductors. Mm -hmm. You know, I was like my, and that's just the way that I'm structured with the way that I low bar squatted, you know, a long femur guy, you know, been over more short torso, you know, and you could kind of tell that from your soreness pattern. It's like do a bunch of, you know, heavy low bar squats. Where was I sore the next day? Well, glutes and adductors, mm -hmm. not surprising. That's, that's what grew, you know, not that the soreness produces the growth, but it's an indicator of like what's receiving the stress. Right. My quads didn't really get sore, you know, unless I had like a, a layoff and I didn't feel much in there, but it was, so I was very posterior chain kind of dominant. That's just based on the way that I was built. Lots of hip um, extension, you know, yeah, lots of hip extension, lots of hip extension. And so it's like, so for, for, uh, so for me, you know, if I was going to go into bodybuilding, which I'm not, but if I was, you know, then the only way I was able to really get my quads to grow was to squat in more of a high bar style squat mm -hmm. because I needed to get the stress onto that muscle group. Right. Right. Yeah, and, and the reason I framed the question that way, Andy, is because in addition to this this guy that I that I saw at the gym, as I'm training at these commercial gyms doing dumbbell stuff and machine stuff, um, I see these guys and the majority of them I wish I could wish I could bring together for an hour conversation. Because I see every time I'm there, they're there, even if I go on off days. So that means they're there five, six days a week. And um right. these these are mainly guys in high school. And they're probably an average of 160 or 170 pounds, and a couple of them have have pretty well defined arms. Um, but and I have I have a, a an illustration in mind that I use to explain to people that ask, and I don't give unsolicited advice. But actually, I might switch to your illustration about education because that's that's more elegant. But the one that I use is you're you're young and you want to get you want to improve your physique, and you're doing all this you know refining stuff, right? So you're kind of like putting icing on the cake, but you forgot to bake the cake first. So, well, think, think of a, think of a, uh, like a sculptor that's, mm. that's making a statue out of clay. Mm -hmm. You want to like a bigger, a bigger block of clay is easier to sculpt, right? If mm -hmm. you start with a, a smaller mass, it's, it's harder to do. So it's, you know, they, they need it's, it, it's going back to the education thing. It's almost like, you know, if you just entered somebody right into a, a you know, a chemistry program in college without all of the, all of the basic knowledge of, um, you know, the reading and the math and the, the, all the, all the other basic sciences, they're, they're going to be lacking, mm. you know, they're not going to do as well as somebody who spent the time developing a, a, perhaps a broader education and then funneling it into something more specific. So, and it's just, you know, a lot of those, those movements, they lack the ability to, one of the things that makes a good movement, whether it's from the strength training standpoint or from a bodybuilding standpoint, it doesn't really matter is the ability to progress that movement over time, mm -hmm. you know, and it's how, you know, and that's where, that's where you're, that's where the gains come from. So people always say, well, what's the difference between like, say bodybuilding training, powerlifting, strength training, whatever it's, it's really at the more advanced stages. It's really about, it's really movement selection mm -hmm. is the only difference, but the same beyond that, most of the same rules still apply in terms of it's still about loading over time, you know, so whether you switch from a low bar to a high bar squat, it's still the same rules still apply. If we want to tell you to get your legs bigger, we tell you what, take your squat from 225 to 315 mm. and then take your squat from 315 to 405. You're going to get bigger. Yep. Well, if you switch at a more advanced stage, you say, okay, well, I'm not getting the hypertrophy that I want in my quads. You're like me, you're all ass and adductors you say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to switch to a high bar style of squat. And you, the first time you do it, you know, let's say whatever you, you start at 275 because you've already built your low bar squat up to four. So you're starting at a higher threshold, 
you know, you're, you've built your, say your low bar squat up to a certain level. So you'd say, okay, I'm going to switch to high bar squat. There's a learning curve. The techniques a little different, you know, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't, the same rules still apply. Mm-hmm. I got to take that high bar squat from 275 to 315 to 365 to 405. That's the only way I'm going to grow. Mm-hmm. It doesn't, it's not, so you don't grow just by, and a lot of people will always say this. They'll say they're trying to get their arms bigger. Let's say they'll say, well, I started training arms, you know, twice a week, but I haven't seen any difference. It's like, you don't really get any credit just for doing an exercise. You have to progress. it. Mm-hmm. So even if it's a bicep curl, it still matters. As so if you start off with a bicep, uh, a barbell curl, you know, and you do the 45 pound bar for a set of 10, well, in a few months you need to be, if you want your arms to grow, you need to be doing 95 for 10. Something's like got the same rules. The, right. the, the, weight, same, the, the same, the volume, something. Right. And it has to, over time, it, you know, it has to be, it has to be the load, mm-hmm. you know, the load has to, the load has to go up over time. Now, mm-hmm. the, one of the primary differences between say bodybuilding and just like with strength training and certainly powerlifting is we talk a lot is like the kind of the gold standard is like one RM, mm-hmm. you know, and I'd say for bodybuilding, the one RM doesn't have really any utility at all because it's, it, that's a, that's a more, that's a more specific skill to get good at, you know, say squatting and pressing and deadlifting heavy singles. Mm-hmm. Um, so when we talk about getting stronger, I'm not necessarily talking about, we need to raise your one RM, but your heavy set of five, mm-hmm. it's fine. So I just kind of did an article for that, for rip for that. That's like an excellent proxy for, for measuring performance. Because when we talk about, we want to go and even if your only goal, I put in that article, something about like, even if performance isn't the goal, performance is still the goal mm-hmm. because it's the only metric that we have in the, in the gym. If we, if we go in, if we want to grow, you know, growth happens too slowly to measure. You can't go in there and put a tape measure around your arms, you know, after every workout and see if you've grown or not. So you have to track performance. Mm. It's the only metric that it's the only metric that's trackable from one workout to the next, to the next, to the next, that we can, you know, string together over a six month period of time or a year period of time to see, to see if there's any, um, you know, any measurable difference. Mm. So well, it doesn't. So the rules still apply. It's, it's the only difference. A lot of times is exercise selection, you know, especially if you want to compete in bodybuilding, you have to expand your exercise selection. You have to train biceps. You have to train triceps. You have to do some of these stuff that maybe if you're just more interested in just a more general strength or even just getting bigger, you may not spend as much time on, say, the smaller accessories. You can get away with just, you know, kind of keeping your lift selection more basic and you're still going to grow. You may not hit complete physique development, but you don't necessarily need to get into all those little things. Or if, if you're actually bodybuilding, you have to, you have to train everything, mm, you know, it's mm. not, you can't, you can't just do the, you know, say the big four or the big five or whatever, and expect that unless you've got some Tyree kill like genetics, you know, you're not most people that are, they're not going to respond the on a physique level just from say a handful of the basics, mm. you know, you're, you're, you're going to have a few that do. I mean, you see that in powerlifting, you see guys in powerlifting that basically squat bench and deadlift and look like they could compete at, you know, uh, at at the, at a high level of bodybuilding. And they've got a, yeah, they are, um, (laughs) you know, and, and, but there's a whole lot more people that train squat bench deadlift, say that's it, Hmm. get really strong and don't necessarily take on those characteristics from a physique standpoint. Some don't even look like they lift depending on the the bag you've been given genetically. And that's yes, the other no, hard truth, a, you know, uh, looking right. at this guy, um, Middle Eastern descent, about six foot, pretty good frame, um, but he's he's predisposed to carry more fat than average. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, when, when he and I were talking in the bathroom, he's talking about how he wanted to lose weight. And I was like, man, the same confusion after all these years. Yeah. I was in the same spot yeah. as you. Every young man's been in the same spot as you. What's it going to take to get the message across? So let's let's start with some very clear actionable advice. Number one, you don't need stronger muscle groups, bigger muscle groups. All of your muscles need to be stronger and bigger. So the way to do that is with compound movements. Don't even think about doing the individual icing on the cake stuff until you've made the whole system bigger and stronger. And that process is called the starting strength novice linear progression, which you and Rip wrote about in your book, Practical Programming. So that's step one. Would you agree with me that that bodybuilding isolation stuff is a complete waste of time if you haven't already gone through the NLP? Is that reasonable? Yeah, by, yeah, by and large, for a young uh, for a young guy that 
has not lifted before. And let's say his ultimate goal is to, if we just take a hypothetical person, you know, let's say the kid's 20, I don't know. And, you know, eventually say he wants to go into bodybuilding, but he's never touched a weight before, you know, um, that's rare that you, I mean, most people have touched some weights before or whatever, but let's sure. just in this hypothetical situation. And sorry, real quick, you know, he doesn't say, want to get into bodybuilding per se. He just kind of wants to get laid and feel, feel good about the way he yeah. looks. Right. He wants, <laughs> yeah. He wants to be, he wants to be, you know, jacked and tan. Yeah, sure. You know? And yeah. so that's, you know, the, 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 the thing where people get thrown off with it, with the novice linear progression, they look at it. And they're like, well, this isn't enough. This isn't enough mm. to, you know, it's not enough exercise. And it's like the, what they don't get is when they're, when they're looking, when they're at the front and they don't get how, sh- how short of a time you're actually spending on this relative to your whole training career. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's, it's this, I always tell people it's the starting mm-hmm. strength mm-hmm. method. Mm-hmm. It's not, this is not the methodology for life. Six, nine so months, just get started. Yeah. So yeah. you're, so it's, you're building a base. It's like, you're, you want to go to college, but you don't know how to read, write and do math. Like we got to do a crash course on read, writing, you know, reading, writing and math before we can stick you in this, you know, college program. And that's kind of what the starting strength program is. You're learning and you're learning more than just like, you're learning more. It's not just about getting stronger. You're like, you're, you're there's even just some stuff that doesn't even have anything to do with the training, just learning your way around the gym. Mm you know, with, and having less stuff to do. Mm-hmm. I mean, how many clients do you have when they begin, they like, can't put the collars on the bar right. or they, you know what I mean? Like simple things, or they don't, you know, they misload the bar with, you know, you tell them put 165 on and they put 175 on, mm-hmm. you know, that mm-hmm. like clients do that all the time. And so it's like little things like, like they haven't even mastered the, the, the basics that aren't even training related, just knowing your, just being able to kind of knowing your way around a weight room. Um, you know, or around a gym. So we're going to give them as little as possible to focus on and only focus on the things that, that matter mm. and really move the needle forward. And then, you know, once that base is established and we've, t- you know, we've taken it as far as we can get it, then, you know, that's, that's what I always say about intermediate training is the, the first thing I do with an intermediate trainee is define their goals. Mm. And it, it, because it's because that's where the, that's where that's going to help guide your decision-making because it's like we have the novice program and it's pretty straightforward, right? Like regardless of the goal, I want to just be stronger or I want to do bodybuilding or I want to do powerlifting or I want to get better at sports. Like we can use that program with very few minor modifications for just about anybody. Mm -hmm. Right. And then we, you get to the intermediate program and that's where everybody gets thrown off because it's like the road forks, and a lot of, it's not just like two directions. It's like a lot of different directions. You say, okay, it's like, again, going back to the education thing, you have to declare a major, you know? So it's like, what do you want to do? You want to be a power lifter? You want to be an Olympic weightlifter? You want to be, you want to play sports? You want to do bodybuilding? Or do you want to stay on a more general path of just, I just want to get a little stronger and a little bigger. Like that's okay too. Mm-hmm. But you're going to start modifying the training a little bit for each person um, based on their goals. If they're going to be an Olympic weightlifter, well, guess what? We got to start doing a little more of now. We, you know, we, now we want to do a little more than just power clean one or two times a week. We want to get a little more specific. If we want to do bodybuilding, well, let's look at, you know, let's open up the, let's open up the, uh, exercise selection category a little bit, not, not necessarily huge, but you add in a few more things, make some modifications or whatever that you want to do for this person. And that's, I mean that, and then you kind of take it from there. But that's that's the kind of the way that I look at it. And I think a lot of people that are get into intermediate training don't do that as they don't. And a lot of coaches don't uh, don't do it for their clients either. Is and it, it's just a quick five minute conversation of, you know, hey, you know, we're the, this program that we've been running now is kind of starting to run its course. It's starting to beat you up. I don't know how much you know more progress we're going to make doing this. So we're going to start talking about a little bit you know, a little bit different way to train in terms of the programming, all the same basic stuff still going to be in here. We're still squat, bench, deadlift, overhead press, all that. It's still there, but we're going to start looking at, um, you know, tailoring it a little bit, maybe more specifically to you. What, where, where do you think you want to go with this? You know, are you, what are you in the person? And they'll generally tell you, you know, Hey, I'd love to sign up for powerlifting meet. All right, cool. Now we have a direction, mm-hmm. you know, or else it's, it's like, there's too many variables to, <laughs> there's too many variables to try to cover. Um, and, and goals if somebody doesn't define other, a goal, don't they? So, right. So if you don't define yeah, it up exactly. front and you're trying to lose weight and you're on Andy's, you know, power building program, it's just like, well, those are kind of conflicting goals, aren't they? Right. Yeah. yeah. You know, and it's, and it's, so it's like, you know, you just have to ask people to figure out what they want to do and then make the, you know, make the appropriate changes for that person. I think that's what, 
that's basically what happens is it just gets a little bit more individualized and it's not going to vary that much between individuals. If you have, a um, you know, two people that are both been training, say for, you know, six, nine months or whatever, and they both want to go into powerlifting. Well, their programming is probably going to look somewhat the same at the beginning. Whereas in two or three years from now, let's say they're both still competing and they're both more serious about it. Their programming may look radically different mm-hmm. because the longer you go, the more advanced you get, the more hyper individualized you you're going to get one guy maybe doing a really high frequency, high volume program. Cause that's what works for him. Mm. The other guy may be really low, lower frequency, higher intensity, less, you know, less volume because that's what works for him. So like at, at the more advanced level, it gets a lot more individualized and you just have to kind of figure that out over time. Right. So, but at the, at the beginning, it's like an early intermediate way. It probably looked fairly similar. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think uh, a few of the points you raised there outlined specifically why this demographic is actually not a great fit for our gyms. Even though they're such a fantastic fit for starting strength, they just don't know it. Because you have to have the wisdom to understand that you can't just go to the gym and do some stuff and feel some muscle fatigue and then go home and do that again next time when it feels like you're recovered. So you have to actually have a bigger goal in mind and um, a a plan that you're not just freestyling, a plan that that someone else has developed over time and proven that you can follow to give you the outcome that you want. But that's not how young men train. Young men jump into the gym and and do what their friends are doing, right? They they do. And they, you know, it's the, that, that, and that's why doing something like starting strength could be so important for somebody that was say, uh, wanted to compete in bodybuilding later on because the, so much of what you see with guys that are trying to do bodybuilding is exactly what you said is they basically just wing it. Mm-hmm. They're just winging their sessions. Um, they, they go on it. They're just in the gym. They're chasing the pump, you know, so they pick a handful of exercises, say oh, it's a chest day or whatever. They pick two or three, four exercises for the chest. And they're basically just chasing a pump. Mm-hmm. They're not tracking anything. They're not, they're not, a, you know, they, they kind of go by just completely go by feel in terms of how much weight they want to use for that day, but they're not, you know, they, they push to failure or whatever, but they don't know, you know, I did a hundred pounds for 10 reps last time on a given exercise. I need to try, you know, 105 pounds for 10 today. They don't, you'd be surprised how many people don't think like that. Yeah. But if I think if they had a, a better background in something that's more like what we do in terms of really focusing on the details of the progression of, okay, we did, you know, three sets of five at 200 pounds last time. We, the, the goal today, our focus is three sets of five at 205. Yep. You know, we got to get that five pound increase. And I think if more bodybuilders apply that type of thinking of the systematic load increases over time to what is a more specific bodybuilding program in terms of say exercise selection and the weekly layout and that sort of thing, they get much better, much better results. And in fact, I'm going to throw a name out there for a lot of you. Some of you guys that are listening to this that are my age or older will that did a lot of the bodybuilding stuff back in the nineties are going to know who Dante Trudell is. And a lot of you guys are going to be like, who is that? Um, but he's the guy that's, he's been a, um, he's been a highly, highly respected bodybuilding coach kind of behind the scenes. He's not a super public guy. Doesn't have any real social media to speak of or anything like that, but he's been doing it a long, long time. And his message is very, very similar to what our message is, which is that 90% of these guys that are involved in bodybuilding, he's working with top level guys, not, not amateurs. 90% of these guys are doing a bunch of fluff that is not contributing at all to their uh, physique development. Mm -hmm. And and that all of these guys would do better to narrow their focus down on exercise selection into the, into the good movements that can be progressed in load over time. Um, You know, and he's been pushed in that type of training for a long, long time of, of the same thing. It's, it's not, it's not to see how many different variations of, you know, quad, different quad movements you can do. It's, you know, take your high bar squat from, you know, take your, uh, from, you know, 500 for five to 500 for 10, mm-hmm. you know, that's that, ty- that line of thinking, mm-hmm. um, you know, it's, it's, it's pushing the lifts up, you know, and thinking more about performance and log booking and, and having those small wins every day or every week or every month that accumulate over time. And only by thinking that way, are you going to get the, the results that you want in terms of your physique development, muscle size and that sort of thing. And so that's, that's kind of, um, uh, that's, that's kind of the approach that I take with my clients too, is, is, you know, again, if you're, even if the goal is not performance, the goal still has to be about performance. Yeah. 
You know, and, and I, uh, I do see some progression in terms of people's understanding of this. When you go to commercial gyms, there certainly are more squat racks than there used to be. And there are more oh, yeah. people in the racks trying to lift heavy weights and trying to lift heavier. But the number of people that are still running around in circles, I'm just surprised because we've got YouTube, uh, the Blue Book's been around a while. Um, th all this has been figured out, but for some reason, it's still kind of like a hidden secret. You know, I, I well, want to... Oh, go ahead. And also too, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of weird too. Like, like the bodybuilding thing, it often gets like for people that don't like it, that, that, are that it's an easy sport to make fun of. Right. Um, but they kind of set themselves up for that just with the whole, you know, the, the, and the, yeah. the yeah, the mankini and, you know, it's kind of an easy sport <laughs> to make fun of. And, but at, at the same time, um, the detractors straw man, what it is a lot of times they sure. go, well, bodybuilding is just all leg extensions and, and, uh, preacher curls and, and lateral raises. But if you actually look, if you've actually trained in gyms where there were high level bodybuilders, which I have, you know, or just, you know, like you said, YouTube is there, the old videos that guys used to have before YouTube, where it was just, you know, there wasn't even any sound. It was just a VHS tape and they just recorded their week of workouts. Mm -hmm. Guess what all the high level guys are doing? Heavy Squatting. shit. Ev <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's Ronnie doing 800 for two on the deadlift five yep. weeks out from the Olympia. It's 495 barbell rows, you know, for sets of 10. It's, you know, I think 495 or five, five or five or six plates on the, on the bench, you know, for like sets of eight to 10, you know, it's like, most of the top level guys are training this way. The, and it's the idea that, yeah. And they do the other stuff too. Yeah. They're doing the flies and the curls. They and have the, to, they, all that. they have, you have, you have to, yeah. you have to, you can't, it's not, but the basics are still there and you have to look, you say, well, what's the, you know, these obviously drugs and genetics and all that kind of stuff. But at the same time, even with the drugs and genetics, most of them are still reliant on progression on these good exercises, um, you know, over time. So yep. it's, you know, and it's like, it's one of those things where I always tell people, we always, we discount a lot. We say, well, people that aren't drugs and genetics, we can't really learn anything from them. Well, it's like, maybe, maybe not, but it's like, you don't have that, the drugs that they're, that they're using, you don't have their genetics. What makes you think that you can get away with doing less effective exercises than they are? <laughs> you know, I That's use that, on. I use that a lot with people. I use that on. with people with diet, yeah. with diet, because yeah. you look at the way Every bodybuilder that you talk to at a high level, the, the hardest part of that sport is the diet. It's not mm. the training. Mm -hmm. It's the eating. And it's the same shit over and over and over. It's the choking down the chicken and chicken rice and, and rice. steak and rice. It's just mm -hmm. over and over and Broken. over and over again. And there, there's a reason for that. And and people will always go, well, you know, he's he's bigger and stronger than me. It, it's just because he's got great genetics and and access to all these drugs. Yeah, he does. And but look how he's still eating. Mm -hmm. And all of them, if they could, if they could, if they could get around that if they could not eat those six or seven chicken and rice meals a day mm. would not do it. If there was, a, if there was a way to just have the drugs and the genetics make them not have to eat like that, they wouldn't be. Mm -hmm. But the reality is the food is still necessary. So you with your average genetics and no access to drugs, what makes you think that you can get any results without the same type of dedication to the diet? Yes. You know, you're going to eat a bowl of cereal. You're going to eat a bowl of cereal for, uh, for breakfast and a sandwich for lunch and then like whatever for dinner and think, you know, and then say, Oh, it's just drugs and genetics. Right. Well, yeah, it is, but there's a lot that you could be doing to fill in that gap. Um, and, and so that's, I always, I always try to point that out to people with the eating part of it. Cause that's the other, I mean, with all this stuff, r regardless of how you train, whether it's basic barbell or bodybuilding or whether the goal is size or strength or whatever, I still think with most people, that the, the gap there that where they don't make the progress that they want is less about the training and more about the diet mm -hmm. is that they just don't people just they don't eat enough or when they do eat they 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 eat um they eat in a way that isn't efficient in other words you know people that don't eat all day and then they go home at night and think that you know trying to force feed five thousand calories between you know six and eight p.m is going to is going to be the same thing as as having a well-structured you know, meal plan where you're eating that same amount of calories, you know, spread out with higher quality foods throughout the day, mm -hmm. you know, that, that all of that stuff matters. And I, I think at the end of the day to, to really ultimate, ultimately reach whatever your potential is, is at most people, the missing link is uh, to a large degree is, is on the, uh, is on the diet because it doesn't matter whatever, whatever pro you could be on the most well-designed program in the world. And if your diet is inadequate, you're not going to make that much progress. Sure. You, you can know, have a, and, and a high performance so, vehicle, and if you don't have the right fuel, you're not going anywhere. right. People and people try to always try to do that. They always want to program around 
an insufficient diet. Mm-hmm. And it's like, it's not going to work. It could be, we could go low volume, high volume, high frequency, low. It doesn't matter. Like it, it, you're not going to program around insufficient protein and calories. Mm. Um, if you're trying to grow, you know, and it's, um, and, and in, in that same vein, I'd say a lot of people get better than average progress on maybe programs that aren't as good, mm-hmm. but if they have a real attention to detail, uh, and real consistency with the diet, mm-hmm. they can actually get quite far on maybe what we would consider suboptimal programming. So I think that's when we talk about bodybuilding, the, 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 the training is still just a stimulus. That's sure. all. It's just, that's just the stimulus. And, and so the, the, the nutrition part is, it's not like, oh, this would help. It's like, no, this is part of the deal. This is the training is a hundred percent and the diet is a hundred percent. It's not like you can't, you can't divorce it too, especially the stronger that you get, the more advanced you get, the more important it becomes. I mean, how many people do we see in the gyms that make really good progress the first few months still on a shitty diet mm-hmm. and then they hit a hard Everyone. wall. And yeah. if their diet, if their diet's not fixed, you know, that's why I like to start people off from the get go trying to do a better job with it. So they're not like now, okay, let's, you know, it's like, we're going to try to learn how to develop good study habits when we hit our master's program when well, it's too late. Right. You know? Yep. That's a, so, I, I really, I really like that, that, uh, analogy. I'm going to borrow that one from me if you don't mind. I also sure. really liked what you said about, uh, the three main variables that contribute to physique, which are genetics, drugs, potentially, and the intelligence of your training program, which includes diet. And yeah, right. you can't do a thing about your genetics. And this is a really important message. And I wish it was a message that I understood when I was younger, because when I, in 1999, Fight Club came out and Brad Pitt was the ideal male physique and he probably weighed, you know, 155 or something, right? But he was, he was right. shredded. And it's like, you're never going to look like that. I'm never going to look like that. Trying to look like that actually doesn't make any sense because although you can see his muscles, if you saw him in person, they're not exactly imposing. Um, right. So this this guy that I met at the gym, his name's Alex, by the way. Alex, I'm going to send this to you. He, uh, you know, like I said, he's trying to lose weight, and he carries more body. He's carrying extra body weight based on his genetic predisposition, predispos- extra body fat that is, and um, it's he's insecure about it, and and that sucks. I wish he wasn't. I wish he. Uh, you know, I wish he felt more secure in his own skin. And I know that he would if he gained weight, if he gained right. 20 pounds and went to the starting strength novice linear progression. And I told him this, and his face was exactly what he'd expect it to be, which was like, nope. I just basically told him what his his belief in God is false or something, right? Like all of his deeply held right. conceptions of things have just turned on on their head because he's thinking that he has to lose body fat and improve the size of his muscles. But it's like, no, you need to go through a process. And step one of the process is actually gaining weight. And believe it or not, as you start gaining that weight, you're going to look better. You're going to look better. Yeah. So it's it's unfortunate. And I just wish um, I wish people understood that uh, you know, you you may get your deadlift to five hundred and you'll look as good as you can possibly look. But that may not right. be anywhere near where you want to look based on your genetics and lack of drug use potentially and diet, right? Um, so I think that's just an an important message to send. It's like, be, be honest with yourself about your genetic potential. However, I'll throw a picture of my before up here on the screen. Your potential is probably significantly better in terms of growing size, um, muscle size and, and just improving the, the shape of your physique. That potential is probably significantly more than you imagined. Um, it's just, it always, yeah, right. It always is. The ceiling is always much higher than what people think it is because I mean, most people, and even those of us that, you know, kind of know, I mean, I, I know that like, let's say my own training right now, I'm not doing everything that I could be doing to, to make sure that I get, you know, the maximum, you know, result out of my training. Most people aren't, you know, but if you're really serious about it, you really want to move the needle, you know? And I think that's, that's like, like, like your buddy there, you know, going through a progressive program like the novice linear progression and having and fixing his diet, you know, not gaining the 20 pounds by force feeding himself. Um, but by having a, you know, it's a kind of the thing we always say, like training, like a power lifter, eat like a bodybuilder. Like, you know, a lot of times those guys are going to see like a recomp type Mm -hmm. thing happen where they're, you know, that's one of the great things about being a beginner. It's harder to do the longer you train, but that's one of the things that beginners, you know, or somebody, if you've ever come off of like the long layoff where you haven't trained over a long period of time, and you've lost some muscle mass and you've gotten fat, 
like you, you're, you're going to, you wind up doing both. Mm -hmm. You know, you kind of do the, the quote, the impossible of, of, uh, losing some body fat and gaining the muscle beginners have the same potential if their diet is right. Mm. Um, you know, and they, they can, like you said, you can, you can lose, you know, if the guys, let's say 25% body fat. I mean, you can, you can lose 20 pounds and still be 20% body fat mm -hmm. because you, you know, you don't, you're not, you're losing muscle. You're not, you're, you're dieting and not retaining the muscle that you have because you're, you know, you're either, you're on you know, some sort of linear starvation type diet or, or whatever, you're not training correctly. Um, but you know, it's all of those, all of those things contribute to, uh, you know, reaching or not reaching the physique goals that you might have. Mm -hmm. the, the, the one thing that you can track, I mean, the one thing that you have the most control over is your training mm -hmm. and your lifts and where, where your lifts are at, uh, you know, and it's like, there's be the, the higher up you get on the strength side of things, the more important all of the other things become, um, the, the, the diet and say exercise selection, you know, those are all kind of the smaller variables we would say, because the higher up you get, you know, the less potential those increases have to make significant improvements on your muscle mass. In other words, if you have a guy, let's say like where I was, let's say you're squatting in the mid five hundreds and you still have what would be considered a less than impressive set of quads. Mm -hmm. Does getting to 600, is that going to significantly improve that development? Or am I just going to keep kind of growing in the same pattern I've been growing? that's a different set of circumstances than the guy that's squatting at, it's not like my quads are small. Mm. It's just relative to everything else from a bodybuilding standpoint, they would have not, they would have been a weak point. Sure. And, and that's, if you had a longer that's, torso, again, we, that, that may not have been the case. Exactly. Right. Yeah. If I was shaped differently, it may not have been the case. So that's where we, we were talking about the, at the beginning where, you know, it's the kind of the, the, the low hanging fruit is to make the, make those big improvements at the front end of your training, getting your squat from 135 to 225 to 315 to 405 to 495. Okay, now, and I don't know what the cutoffs are. A lot of these are arbitrary. I'm just choosing, you know, you start to see, I don't want to say it's easy to get a guy up to 405 for five on squats, but it's not in today's day and age with the, the knowledge and stuff that we have now, it's, you see it more often than you used to. Mm -hmm. um, you start a, a pretty big drop off when you get to say squatting five plates for a set of five. Sure. You know, um, you know, and then beyond that, it's, it's Instagram will make it feel like everybody's squatting, you know, 585 for reps, except you. But the reality, you know, that's where it's good to get. That's in, in today's day and age, we live in a world where everybody trains alone in their garage and then their own, they're like their gym is Instagram. Mm. That's their community. Mm. And so you're, you're, it'll make it feel sometimes like you're the only guy that's, um, you know, like I said, not squatting 585 for reps and that your 405 for five is somehow not impressive or whatever. But yet that's why getting out into the world, into the physical world matters. Cause if you walk into most gyms, you know, commercial gyms and your squat and quality reps at 405, you're, you're going to be one of the top guys in most gyms, yeah. you know, with it, with the exception of a few, you know, where, where people kind of congregate, but that's, that's the low hanging fruit is to get those lifts up to a respectable level. And then at a certain point, it, it becomes like, it's kind of like, if we go back, I like to use uh, analogies in other sports because it makes sense. It's if we go back to that, that uh, track athlete that we were talking about at the beginning, it's like at the beginning, when the kid's squatting 135, what's the best way to make him faster? Get him to squat to 405. Sure. You know, and then he gets to a certain point. Now, how much does, let's say, you know, he, the kid, you get him to, he's a, you know, high school kid or whatever, smaller, he's 405 for five, pretty good. You know, well, that's real good for a high school kid, mm. you know, and, but it, so it's like, okay, at that point now, how much more is getting him from, say, 405? to 425 to 445 how much an impact is that going to have on his speed because now he's no longer really at a yeah not much he's strong and especially for the especially for the amount of work that he's going to have to put in to move the needle so that now the kid's probably better to get improvement to spend more time on the track right you know and, and by the way if he, spends, if he spends too much time in the weight room the fatigue is going to affect his ability to practice on the track so now exactly. the equation and gets switched that's, and that's what that's gets tough at the, when you're working with athletes or, or whatever, because we know that building the strength is that, you know, when, when the kid is, is weak, he lacks force production capacity. He lacks muscle mass. Improving that is going to improve his speed more than anything else. And then at a certain level, it becomes where, yeah, okay. And then another 20 or even 40 pounds on a squat, how much is that going to actually improve it? And what is the cost 
for doing that. If, 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 if he had to struggle mightily, say, to get to 405, but he's going to have to struggle even more to get to, say, 445. Mm. And so, like you said, the fatigue cost of that, the injury potential, um, you know, for that is maybe not going to be worth it. You may get more improvement now of spending more time developing a start position off the blocks, you know, working on the technical aspects of becoming a better sprinter and, and spending more time on the track, doing more specific um, sprint exercises, whatever it is that they do, you know, at the, I'm not privy to whatever they do at the highest levels of, of, of track and field, but whatever it is that they do to make those guys super fast, you know? So, um, but that's, it's a, kind of the same thing in bodybuilding. Uh, you know, if you want to go back to that, it's, you know, build up the, build up the basics. And then once those basics don't have the capacity to deliver what you need them to do, then you have to switch to something a little more specific. You know, if that makes it does, if that analogy makes sense, Definitely. you know, it's like, it's like, it's like the low bar squat for me. If I take in my low bar squat from 550 to 600, like how much, if my, this, this, and this is my problem with the, the, some of the volume crowd, the, the volume crowd that always preaches, well, the answer to hypertrophy is just more, more volume. Well, yes and no, but usually the answer is, is to do not do more. It's to do better. Hmm. Okay. And so what you see is these guys, let's say for instance, the way that a power lifter bench presses, okay? Wider grip, big arch in the back, you know, maybe bringing it lower down, you know, it's, it's to improve the leverage, mm -hmm. right? You're trying to shorten the distance. It's that particular exercise for most people is not a good, is not a good exercise for pectoral development. For some people it is based on the way that they're, but in general, it's not a great exercise. It's not a great, say, pec exercise. It doesn't have, so, but what a lot of the volume crowd would tell you to do that, that comes from kind of the, the, the uh, more of a strength bias world is just, we'll just do more sets of that. Mm -hmm. Just keep doing it. Well, if it's already a shitty exercise, don't keep doing more of a shitty exercise. That's not going to make change it, do mm -hmm. it better. And a lot of times what you'll find out is you need a lot less volume than what you think is if you're doing an, um, uh, a different exercise. Um, one of the, one of the things I like to use is, is this analogy here. If, if I deadlift 225 for a set of 10, and let's say me and you were built identically, which we're not, but if we were, let's say we're built identically, and I deadlift 225 for a set of 10, and you deadlift 225 for a set of 10 from a two-inch deficit, hmm. who did more volume? Same volume, isn't it? You did. Sa it's well, the same, but more you- stress. But it is. More stress. Exactly. Right. So- what is volume? Volume is just, it's a, a number of reps that we did, but what was the stress, let's say to the, uh, let's just say to the quads, mm. who did more volume mm, on the quads? Volume the guy that did the two the inch muscle group. Yeah, I got you. Exactly. Yep. And so a lot of times when you see, I think part of the reason that you see all these recommendations for more and more and more volume, more frequency is because they're using shitty lifts mm -hmm. and they don't, there's no, where they would, they would be better to do is to use a better lift and you would need less volume. In other words, what would be the what would be better for a guy who's not say like I'll just use myself for example. It's not getting good quad development from a low bar squat. Mm. I don't have I have a build that makes it very, a lot of hip extension. I'm all adductors and glutes and hams. Right? Is it better for me to just keep doing more and more and more low bar squats, hoping that somehow my my quads will grow, mm. or should I switch to an exercise that is more specific to the quads? Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. And I would probably need less of that. Which you should only if worry about sense. if you're if you're already strong. So let, let's actually yeah. um, let's switch back to the to our buddy Alex real quick. So let's say we get Alex and all his friends in the gym, and we've just talked to them for an hour, and we've got all of them nodding their heads and understanding that what they're doing is a complete waste of time. They'll be much happier if they do a structured program oriented around building size and strength like the NLP. Um, they should not be trying to lose weight because that's the exact opposite of, of what they need to be doing, which is building muscle. Um, and then they go, okay, cool. I'm willing to do all that. I'm with you, but, but then what, right? So it's like my, my, for these guys where their goal is purely physique, what advice do you have for someone who's like, okay, I'm willing to get through the NLP or do as much strength work as I have to tell me what, where that, um, line is drawn as, as the first question. And then secondly, what happens next? What happens after they're, if they run through like, say, a novice linear progression, like yeah. what happens so, after that? Well, or, or if uh, actually, so it depends on where you, where you'd have a men, because I typically recommend, so I told this guy and his, he, he looked at me like I was insane. Um, he looked at me like I was speaking another language. I said, you need to get your deadlift to 500 ish squat to 400 ish bench to 300 ish press to 200 ish. And it won't take you that long. 
And then once you do that, if you want to, you know, do some calf raises, knock yourself out. But at the moment, they're a waste of time. So I guess the first question is, where do you, you know, generically recommend young, healthy, average man men go in terms of strength uh, until they start specializing a little bit on some of the, um, you know, icing on the cake stuff? So I went over this in one of my podcasts, um, and I think for most people, um, you know, after a, I think, are we talking about somebody who wants to compete in bodybuilding? Or are we talking to just somebody wants who just wants to be, yep. just wants to be jacked at the pool? Yeah, yeah okay. exactly. I mean, I think the, the right, I think beyond the, the novice program, then I think a good place to go from that is to just from a purely, I think from a physiological standpoint, but also from a, a level of practicality, I think a four day split makes the most sense mm -hmm. of just, and just a basic upper lower split. Because what happens is, is when you need the, especially the need for more um, upper body exercises increases. And it gets harder and harder to do that in a full body uh, type of thing, just from a time standpoint. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, especially once you get strong, you get strong, it takes forever to just get through a squat workout, right? You yep. gotta, you take a lot, you have more warm up sets, you take more rest time between work sets. So you get through the squats and you get kind of, kind of rewarm up for the bench, you know, go through that whole process of the bench. And then, the and then by the time you're done with the deadlift, it's like, even if you have energy, it's like, shit, I got to get, I got to get to work. It's two and a half you hours know what I mean? and it's you're like, fried. It, right. Yeah. Right. It's like, it's just a practical reality of you. It's hard to just keep adding stuff onto those full body workouts. Mm -hmm. So um, even if you could recover from it, which would be difficult, you don't necessarily have the time to do it. And so I think it makes a lot of sense just to switch to a four day split, you know, it, and it's like, there's a ton of examples of this in practical programming. Um, you know, it's just like, you've got your two upper body, like Monday and Thursday, you're doing more upper body, uh, day and, and Tuesday and Friday is your lower body day. I think for most people, for the non bodybuilder, the lower body day doesn't really change. What I tell people is like squat deadlift and go push the prowler. Like, you know what I mean? Like you don't really need that much more. The squat is a different animal than the, the squat is unique in that there's no, there's no upper body equivalent to like what the squat does for the lower body. Mm. There's no one single upper body exercise that just basically annihilates everything from the waist up. Right. The right. way that the squat, you know, a good squat program, you know, your everything is, and that's, you know, a, 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 a good squat, you're, you're for the non-competitor, you're, everything's getting trained in just the, the way that it should. Um, you're able to keep your numbers up just from a general, regardless from the physique standpoint, just from a general strength standpoint, you're able to keep your numbers up. And then you kind of, you, I just think of the deadlift almost as an extension of the squat. You're just kind of polishing it off mm. with a pull from the floor. So it's like, you know, squat and deadlift or squat and some deadlift variation, whether it's rack pulls or, you know, what, there's, there's a million ways to do it. You keep power cleans in there mm. or you can not, it doesn't really matter. It's like your choice, but the squat is going to do like 90% of the lower body work for you, you know, and then the deadlift kind of, the deadlift kind of covers like some of the, the low back work and that sort of thing, but you can just squat and deadlift. Um, you know, and then in, in place of like a lot of accessory lower body type work, which has the potential to make the, the problem with a lot of that stuff is the soreness that it produces. Mm -hmm. You know, you do a high volume of like hack squats and leg presses, leg extensions, leg curls or whatever. Like if you're a bodybuilder, I think there's utility to those movements, uh, you know, in addition to the uh, in addition to the main barbell stuff, but in for like just kind of the average. Yeah, always right. in addition to that's yep. the thing is we don't allow that straw man to creep in where it's like, oh, we just bodybuilders just do leg extensions like that's not true. Right. It's never true. Mm -hmm. You know, they do those things in addition to, you know, the more the more systemic taxing movement. So it's always in addition to the problem with a uh, like a non competitor doing all that is you, you probably get more like, you know, functional strength. And you get the, the conditioning part in and all that with, say, sled dragging or prowler pushing or whatever versus – or just doing nothing at all, just squatting and deadlifting and going home. Like, mm. you probably don't need a ton more than that, you know. And so – and then, but then the upper body stuff, that's where, like, again, because we don't have a squat equivalent of the upper body. Mm. I mean, the bench and the press don't compare to the squat to what they do to the upper body. So you need – you you know, at a minimum, you need, you know – bench press and something like chin ups or whatever, but for a complete development, there's more exercises that are, that you can play with, um, on the upper body side of thing. So you can, you, you're, you're going to need the time to do that. So it makes sense. You have, you know, and it's just, it's the same thing. You, I mean, the way I usually structure it, it's like, 
Monday would be a more of a bench focused day. Thursday, more of a press focused day. You've got your, you know, your pull-ups, your chin-ups, your rows, your curls, your dips, you know, it's kind of all your basics. There's a, a million different ways that you can organize it, but mm. it's just kind of the, the, ba- the, the basic muscle building exercises twice a week um, with the lower body twice a week. And I think for most people, you know, the sets and the reps and all that stuff change and fluctuate over time and all, but that basic structure, most people probably don't need to go b- beyond that for their physique goals. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you know, and it's, you you can, and I think, you know, even like we talk about more advanced bodybuilding, people say, well, why, you know, how come they do like a body part split, you know, where, you know, the kind of the Monday is the chest day and Tuesday is mm-hmm. back day and yep. because they have to out of necessity, because like we just talked about the, the amount of stress, the amount of stress in order to get continued growth over time, the amount of stress must increase. Sure. Okay. And so the downside of that is the amount of stress increases, which means your your you don't it's very difficult to say for a more advanced guy to do the all of the squatting the benching the deadlifting all that that they need all together in a given workout it needs to be spread out over over time and so that necessitates something like for a more advanced guy something like a body part split because the amount of it, it makes more sense to do it like that than try to do it um where you're trying to get a full body workout in say three, four five days a week and trying to do, you know, a quad exercise five days a week or, you know, chest four days a week, or it's too, it's too difficult to recover from and it's not time efficient. Mm. Um, so the body part split is what allows people to get the adequate amount of stress that they need per muscle group sure. in a, in a practical manner. But for most people, they don't need necessarily all of that. And these guys uh, are training six days a week. And uh, normal people Most don't have them, time yeah. for that. And normal people can't right. recover from that, which is where the drugs come right. in. So don't don't copy the program that doesn't apply to your situation, essentially, is the advice, right? Yeah, I would say, you know, it's, it's, uh, the, there's, there, there's some interesting, um, there's some interesting thoughts out there about why also too, why, um, you know, people at the, at the kind of the tip of the genetic spear or whatever you want to call it, um, actually respond better to uh, consolidation of volume, uh, a, high, a, a mega high dose of volume, say in a single session, and then followed by a lengthy recovery period. There might be a genetic predisposition there in terms of that a response, uh, a better response from that. I would say understanding your genetics is important. I mean, from a powerlifting standpoint, the less genetically gifted somebody is, the more frequency I usually use with them. Hmm. Um, and so they're going to respond better to like a higher, like a higher frequency, um, on the lift. So mm. like a, a guy that's a, you know, really a good genetic responder can get, can get by and make a lot of progress, say benching once a week guys that are, I think less on the less, so more average or below average do better from higher frequency on those lifts. And I think the same thing applies to a more high of a hypertrophy oriented program where they do people that are less genetically dif- gifted do better with a little bit of higher frequency mm. versus consolidating all of their work, say for a given muscle group into one day a week and then letting it, um, and then having a really lengthy recovery time. Yeah. You know, one of the reasons why I think it's so important that we spread this message is because, um, this sort of behavior is not productive at best and can be quite unhealthy and counterproductive at worst. Just yesterday at the crunch next to my house, I saw a guy who was probably still in high school who was a normal skinny kid, but he had very well-developed traps and deltoids and arms. And uh, he had acne all over his, um, all over his triceps. So what, what does that tell yeah. you? He's, he's probably yeah. on some gear, right? And, yeah, uh, at a young age. And that's, that's what, um, you know, Rip's been talking about that for a long time. And I agree with him is like, we actually had a phone call the other day and we were talking about like, you know, the number of baseball players that are using steroids and stuff. And it's like, it may be less so now that they've cracked down on it. But I mean, by and large, there's really no reason for baseball players to be using steroids. Nope. But the fact is, is that the training programs are so shitty that, and they develop such a low return on the strength that these kids aren't, they need to run faster. They need to throw harder. They need to hit the ball further and they're not. And they're they're all the technical work in the world is not getting them any further. Their body has to change. They their body has to have more ability to produce force and their training program 
isn't getting them there. Mm. But, you know, how many guys that play triple A ball, it wouldn't be that hard to get. I mean, how many of them don't squat at all? I mean, right. how many of them, you know, how easy would it be to get that level of athlete to do a 315 for five squat or 365 or four or five? Pretty easy. If, and know, that's probably all they need. Months, they don't. Yeah, yeah. They, they don't need to be an elite power lifter, they, but they need to get up to, say, 315 or 405 or whatever that is in order to kind of that's like like kind of the, the bar that they need to hit to be able to hit the ball, the, the, the distance it needs to travel or reach a certain velocity on their pitch. But their training program is not delivering that. And so they're resorting to the drug use. And I think that's the point that uh, to reference Dante again that he's been making for years is that part of the reason that drug use is so high in bodybuilding I mean, you have to have it. You cannot make it to the Olympia stage or, or even, even at the amateur level, you can't get to the highest levels without it. However, it could be the, the, the dosages could be lower right. if the training was better and it would be better for guys health. I mean, and if you follow the bodybuilding world at all, I mean, guys have been the last several years, guys have been dropping dead left, right, and center oh, yeah. in their twenties, thirties, and forties. And it's because I think, I think it's, it's because the drug use is so high. Mm -hmm. Um, and part of the reason is because the training is not necessarily what it used to be. And I think these genetically gifted guys wouldn't need to use the amount of drugs that they use if their training was better, if they focused on, okay, I'm going to get my bench from 225 to 315 to 405, as opposed to, I'm just going to go in and chase a pump. Mm. Then I wouldn't need as much drugs. If you take enough drugs, you don't have to push your weights up that high. You, don't you have can, to lift. The, the bodybuilding yeah, side, I mean, if you, you want to be big and muscular and you do a bunch of drugs, you'll look, I know a couple of guys, they look, they look great, <laughs> but right. that's and there's, I mean, the best solution. That's what a lot of, a lot of guys do is they go in, if you look at him, you think this guy's huge. And then you watch him lift. You're like, man, he's hardly using any weight. Well, he doesn't need to, he's, he's in there, you know, he can just, he can literally just go in there and chase a pump right. on, on a few machine exercises or whatever and, and grow. And if he pushes it a little harder than that, he's going to grow a lot. Yep. But if he pushed it real hard and, and kept in a focus on the, the squatting and the deadlifting and the, you know, all the good exercises, um, you know, and he focused more on performance on those, then perhaps the need for the drugs would go down. You know, he still, if you want to compete at the highest level, you're still going to have to use them, but maybe not in the dosages that they are, that they are, where they're not all having heart attacks at 45 years old. Yeah. Two and a half grams of you test know? per week probably isn't uh, wonderful for you. To the degree that they make certain forms of training more, uh, better or different than, than if you're not on drugs, I'm not sure about that. I, I mean, Definitely, it makes suboptimal programming more effective. It's kind of the or point you just you know, made, and, right? You know, more right. drugs instead yes, of better can, exercise selection. Right. You can yeah. go in there and chase a pump on shitty exercises and 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 still get bigger. Yeah. Whereas if you weren't on the drugs, you would have to be more focused on better exercises, more focused on progression rather than just training for the pump. And so drugs kind of mask that, mm. um, you know, but – my observation with, I don't use anything, but my, I have, I mean, I've trained a ton of guys that have, mm. and my observation has been that the drugs, and I, I don't know if this is true. This is just kind of my anecdotal observation. They don't necessarily, everybody always says, oh, if you, if you take drugs, you recover faster and you, and you, um, you know, you can, you can train more often and you can do, I don't know that they actually make the recovery faster. I think they make the adaptation more profound. Mm if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So like when we talk about that kind of stress recovery adaptation cycle, you know, when we talk for a normal guy, the adaptation that he's going to experience after a workout or a week's worth of workout or a month's worth of workout is going to be very small. Mm. You know, the adaptation is actually not very profound. It's, you know, however, it's almost like an immeasurably small amount of muscle growth. Mm. And that's what, that's why it takes a long time to get good at this shit. But for a guy that's using that, the adaptation is faster. Yep. And so the, the results are more profound and the stress is actually, he's, he's able to produce more of a stress with uh, a little bit less work. Um, in other words, the, because the, because the drugs are enhancing your performance, your rate of increase is much, much faster on say your ability to add weight to the bar or do more reps at the same weight or whatever metric you're using, you're, you're increasing that much, 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 much faster. Mm. But a lot of guys, if you like a lot of guys that are, that are using drugs because they're able to tax themselves much harder in the gym, they're, they're recover. You have to actually be careful. You can overtrain them like oh, too yeah. much volume, like too much volume is really not good on a guy that's using a lot of drugs because he's able to put 
a lot more into that. And that's another reason why um, this is another little secret, why people don't realize why they look at a bodybuilder's program and they go, well, why is, why is everything that he does like 10 reps and above mm. part of that? Part of that is because it's to protect, protect from tendon injury mm. because of the, the, the force production. Yeah. Well, and the force production capacity of the muscle is exceeding what the tendon can handle. Mm. And so if he trains in say the three to five rep range, does this make sense? Mm-hmm. If he's yep. training in the, in the three, three to five rep range and his, and his, the poundages is going up, 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 really, really fast at those really, really heavy weights. Mm-hmm. He's running a, a huge risk for tendon ruptures. And you see oh, that all the time. Because of the gear. Because he's, he's, because uh, of the gear. Yeah. That's not a natural the, rate of progression. Right. right. So the, the, the ability of the muscle to produce force is exceeding what the tendon mm-hmm. can handle. Interesting. Whereas if you, if you're more, if you're a naturally, a, a naturally trained athlete, your the rate of adaptation is slower, and so everything kind of progresses together, right? The, mm. the 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 muscle size, the ability of the muscle to produce force, and the the ability of the connective tissue to handle that are all kind of developing together. Yep. Whereas if you're if you're on a lot of gear, your force production capacity is going up very very fast, and it's out it's outpacing what your tendons can handle. So a lot of a lot of smarter bodybuilding coaches, in order to keep their athletes from getting um, from getting hurt and injured, especially as it gets closer to pre-contest where a lot of times dehydration is an issue. Um, and uh, because they're dieting, their carbs are low, uh, that sort of, it makes them also more susceptible to, to injury. Um, they will, they will tell them to, uh, you know, keep the, the rep ranges will be much higher, mm. uh, 10 to 20 and, and there'll be maybe more of a focus on say adding reps to a movement. In other words, um, they, they get a guy, uh, let's say to a certain, let's say four or five for 10 or whatever on a squat and say, instead of adding weight to that, I want you to try four or five for 11. Mm-hmm. And then the next time four or five for 12. And then the next time four or five for 13, like that's still like a performance increase without the addition of load. So it's mm. still, you'll still increase mechanical tension on the muscle by adding those reps yep. without necessarily adding the load and exposing that athlete to the risk because the tendon risk goes up as when the load gets heavier. Yeah. Um, and so that's, that's, that's a part of the reason, uh, you see a lot of, you do see a lot of tendon injuries, um, in bodybuilding. So, um, yeah. and it's another reason why some of the guys will closer to cons they're, again, they're on so much gear. Uh, it doesn't, you know, they're going to pick safer movements because right. those last few weeks, few months closer to the contest, the whole thing is just don't get injured. You can't rupture. You know? And they're yeah. Right. right. And so, yeah. um, you know, so that's, that's the big, and, you know, if you're doing five rep, heavy barbell curls, yeah. Can that make your muscle grow? Yeah, sure it can. But what kind of risk does that put your tendon at, you know, versus doing say sets of 15, you can make it grow at a set of 15 also. Um, you know, and if you're on a lot of gear, it doesn't really matter. That's a very so, interesting point. I wasn't aware of that. Um, I, I do yeah. want to, uh, to wrap up on the, on the conversation about drugs. I do want to state my position on this. I think that, um, a lot of people that I've met over the years that have done drugs for improved performance or physique did not need to do the drugs starting strength would have done yeah. the trick. And in general, a drug is a solution to a problem. And I, I don't recommend that you take the risk of taking a drug, especially on a sustained regular basis, um, for something as ephemeral as physique, you know? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think there's any real, and the problem is, it, and you know, it's, you're, you're going to eventually have to get off. Right. And, you know, and that's one of the reasons why, you know, I've never really wanted to dabble in it is because I know my personality is mm. very addictive. Um, and it would be hard for me to get on that, see the gains in size and strength and then get myself off. Yeah. And no, you're that's, right. you, 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 because you're going and you see guys that do that. You see some of these bodybuilders and stuff now, and they're just, you know, they don't lift anymore. They don't, and they're just, they don't even look like themselves anymore. And I think that would be hard, um, to deal with, to see that kind of up and down on size and strength and everything. So to me, it was just a slippery slope. And I always felt like if I want, if I started doing a little, I would want to do more. Um, Same so reason I never tried to just, you know, um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's probably great. You know, it's like, <laughs> right. It, uh, that's just kind of, you know, with age comes a little bit of wisdom of kind yeah. of knowing yourself and knowing your, your tendencies. And so, and plus it's like, there's a certain level of like, enjoyment of the process mm. of the out, the outcome, like you said, is limited by a lot of things. Mm. Um, it's limited by your genetics and, you know, ultimately none of us are, you know, almost nobody listening to this is going to compete at the IPF worlds or the, um, you know, the, uh, you know, be on an IFBB pro bodybuilding stage. And so it's like, 
at that level, what are you really trying to prove or compete for? You know, if you're, it's different, if you're at the competing at the highest level and everybody's doing the same thing and, you know, it's, it's different, but why, you know, I'd never understood that about these amateur bodybuilders. There's no money in the sport. And I never understood why a guy who's never going to make it beyond say that, you know, the NPC nationals or whatever would take the amount because those guys are on just as much if, as drugs as the guys at the very, very top. Right. And it's like, I never understood why, you know, now if you're going to be top five level, Mr. Olympia competitor, and there's, you know, there's uh there's the, the chances there to make the kind of money that some of those guys make, hmm. but even those guys, it's, there's not a, that much money, you know, in that sport. And so, you know, now with the, social media and all that kind of stuff. There's other ways to make money, um, in this industry without having to subject your health, right. Um, to those kind of, um, you know, those types of risks. And so I never really, uh, understood why they would take that level of drugs, uh, for such a low payoff. Right. Yeah. I, I totally agree. And, uh, this guy, Derek, who has a YouTube channel called more plates, more dates. He's uh, very educated on this stuff. The way he puts it is you only get one set of organs. And you only get about a yeah. hundred thousand hair follicles if you give a shit about that. So keep that in mind as you make these decisions. And although um, what I mentioned about you know not not being pro drug as a rule, and if you're in my situation, Rip has done a bunch of podcasts on TRT, and Rip is one of the reasons why I'm on TRT. I had a total test level of two eighty nine at age thirty one. Um, and who knows what that is? Is it environmental estrogens? Is it Crohn's disease? Whatever. All I know is I felt like a bag of shit and I couldn't recover. Right. But to your point, I'm on test forever, but I'm on a therapeutic right. dose of test. I'm on 180, 200 yeah. bags a week, not, you know, two and a half grams a week. Right. Um, yeah. And I, I don't think we've seen any evidence that, you know, low dose therapeutic testosterone over a prolonged period of time is harmful to your health. In you fact, know? And in it, fact, I think a lot, of, the I think a lot of old, exactly. And yeah. I think a lot of old guys, um, would could see a lot of improvement in their, you know, in their life to, to, to take it. So I, you know, um, I'm, I, it's a different, you know, for those that don't know though, you know, TRT versus what, and, uh, either like a national level NPC competitor, certainly an IFBB guy is taking, it's not even close. They're not in the same, the same. universe. I mean, it's, yeah. it's yeah. not in the same universe and right. it's not, and you can get, you know, I've had clients that jump on TRT and it's like they got on a, a cycle. Yeah. of, of, of a heavier stuff. I mean, and, and on a, and on a low dose, so you can get a lot of, out of just a, like you said, a low therapeutic dose of TRT, especially if it's really, really low. Yep. Um, you know, you, you will still see immediate benefits to your training in terms of both your strength and your muscle size. Um, and also, you know, all the other stuff that comes with a mood improvement and all that, and all that sort of thing. So, and some um, guys need know, it, man. I, I I mean, there's a guy. Yeah. There's a guy at the Boise gym. I won't mention his name, but I might get him on a case study. We made some decent progress on the NLP. It cut short uh, way sooner than it should have. He's carrying too much body fat. Um, you can tell by looking at his face. His mood isn't good, um, and his aggr- his aggression is non-existent. And uh, uh, you know, we'll, we'll I'll see if I can get him on the podcast eventually. But the, guys like that, I think it. I think there's certainly a, an argument that it's beneficial. You know. Sure. Yeah. Um, the nandrolone stuff, though, so that that's a little more experimental. My my main thinking on this is it's kind of funny, Andy. You might you might enjoy this. That my surgeon, when I told her I was on test, she said, um, "Well, be careful because steroids can be bad for recovery." And I was like, "I think you're talking about catabolic steroids, <laughs> right?" Yeah. Um, and uh, well, it's funny when I when I tore my bicep, I tore my bicep about four years ago on a on a set of deadlifts. Mm-hmm, I remember the, the supinated. Yeah, yeah, I know. And so I never had a major injury in like 20 years of training. And then I just had one bad rep. Well, you were fucking doing up. speed deadlifts with a switch grip, man. What are I you was, doing? <laughs> yeah, I know. And I was, you know, and I, and the, the, there was a part of me that, that was tell, I had a little voice in my head telling me this is a bad idea. This is a bad idea. And I literally had, I had like one, one set left to go. And I was like, I, I should have got my straps out of my truck. And it was literally just laziness. If I didn't want to walk out, to get the straps out of my truck because I trained at another gym a, a few days ago and I had left some of my equipment in there. And so there was a little voice in my head saying, you know, go get your straps. You shouldn't be pulling these speed deadlifts like this, but I'd already pulled a bunch of sets and it was fine. And I was like, yeah, it's four Oh five, which at, you know, at the time for me was not heavy mm. at all, but it was like that, you know, four Oh five, still four Oh five. So whether, even if you're, you know, even if you're an 800 pound deadlifter, it's still 400 pounds. So it was enough to do the trick. And when I, the, when I got into the first meeting I had with the surgeon, the first thing he asked me is, are, are you using steroids? Right. And, 
and that was that was part of the, the my kind of my first discussion with him about that and he kind of and then i read up on it a little bit more in terms of the risk at which drug use puts your tendons at Makes um, sense. and that was so i that's that's where it piqued my interest um he didn't really have a great explanation for it other than he saw a lot of guys that are on steroids have come in with a lot of tendon injuries mm -hmm. um and so you know that his was all just kind of observational correlation he didn't really um, uh, explain it that well to me, but I started reading up on it a little bit after that. And it, it makes a ton of sense. It makes a ton of it sense. Makes a ton of sense. Yeah. yeah. It makes yeah. a ton of sense that that, that, that would be a risk. Um, and then you look around and, and see at how fast guys progress. You, you look at a guy, sometimes it gets on a lot of gear, um, you know, in the bodybuilding world to say they, you know, and sometimes they don't take that much off season pre contest to get on a lot. And even when they're dieting, their strength is going up and up and up and they'll, they'll go, you know, three fifteen for a set of 10. And then the next week they don't go up like we do with two and a half and fives. It's all right. plates and quarters. Right, right. So they're going three fifteen, three fifteen for a set of 10, three sixty five set of 10 four, And it's like, that's insanely fast, you know, and that the body can not the, 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 the progression that they're making is artificially induced by the drugs, but the adaptations that the body can make are not keeping up with that. And it's, so it's the, the opposite of increase in risk. Yeah, I, t I totally agree. It's the opposite of what I what I think is wise, right? Which is uh, don't use a bunch of drugs to get strong. But if you happen to hurt yourself, um, there might be some drugs you can take temporarily to improve your outcome, whatever collagen synthesis and joint health and everything else by by doing something temporarily. But keep in mind that that comes with a risk too. Um, but, yeah. But but the the overarching theme here is that the drugs aren't necessary for most people. The genetics you can't no. change. But what's within your control is what Andy and Training Rick and spent diet. countless hours writing about in practical programming. And I'm telling you, if you haven't read, read this book, you need to read it twice if getting big and strong is important to you. Because I I mean, I'm asking someone that's kind of biased, but Andy, what else is there on the market that lays out for you exactly how to manipulate your training variables to achieve a strength and size outcome? Is there, what else is there? Oh, I, I don't know. I'm sure there's other stuff. I mean, most of the stuff that, you know, I'm like everybody else nowadays, I get half of my information off the internet rather than books, mm -hmm. you know, which is probably not, a, not a good thing, but I mean, I'm, there's other, there's other smart guys out there. I mean, like I felt like, you know, I get outside the, the, uh, the strength world a little bit and get into the bodybuilding world. And what you find is the good bodybuilding coaches are, are preaching by and large, the same conceptual message that we're, that we're preaching. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Dante would tell you, the, the best way to get your triceps bigger is not to, you know, see how many sets of cable tricep press downs you can accumulate, but take your close grip bench from, you know, 225 to 315. Sure. Which is a message that most of us would tell you. Right. You know, it's like, you know, that's that it's the, so the, the concept is the same um, of that progressive overload over time is, is the driving catalyst for everything. Like it doesn't, I put in that article that I did a few weeks ago. It was like, it doesn't matter. I don't care what your training split is, what your volume is, what your frequency is, or even necessarily what lifts that you do. If you're squatting 315 for five this year, and at the end of the year, at the end of this year, you're still squatting 315 for five, you will not have grown. Right. I don't care. I don't care not what else, you got what fat. other, <laughs> what other, yeah, what other, but what other variables there are that can be manipulated. None of them matter if that, if those performance metrics haven't moved, right. You know, and it's, and so it's, it, it's the, it's the, uh, it's the same regardless of, of the lifts is those, those numbers have to move and it doesn't matter. Um, you know, the, the inverse is true. I don't care if the guy trains with a lot of volume or not a lot of volume or high frequency, low frequency or what lifts. If that squad has gone from three fifteen for five to mm. four Oh five for five, he will have grown. Wrong. There's, there's no way that's around it. it. That's the, that's the only, that, that's the low hanging fruit. That's the, that's, and that's the low hanging fruit that's under our control. Yes. And so that's, you know, that's what matters in all of the, the other details. They matter to a degree, the more advanced that you get. But for most of the people listening to this, the low hanging fruit is to get your numbers up on the yep. basic lifts. Yep. And then from, then you go from there. So in summary, if you are a young man, and you're looking to improve your physique, and you're not already strong, get strong. Get strong. That applies to everyone, right. no matter what, in all circumstances. Secondly, be aware of the fact that there are genetic limitations, and that you may not get to where you want to go just based on the parents that you were, that you were, uh, the family you were born into. 
Um, and the third thing is it might be tempted to resolve that problem with drugs, but uh, in from my point of view, the risk reward ratio of taking a huge amount of anabolics over a, an extended period of time to put on a whole bunch of muscle mass that you're not genetically predisposed to hold, uh, the risk reward scenario probably isn't there. And by the way, if you just get really strong and you get your diet in check, you'll make the most of your situation and you'll be way happier than you were at the beginning. So just just start there, go through the process, don't rush things, don't get distracted by nonsense. And um, you know, you can you can have the outcome that I had and everybody I know who's taken my advice has had when they when they go through this process. It is profound and useful and life-changing in so many different and ways. And also learn learn to enjoy the process. Right. Um, and the process comes with its ups and downs and its successes and failures. And, you know, there's times where you're moving forward, times where you're moving back. And I see so many guys, and this is completely independent of what your ultimate goal is training wise that ruin the process for themselves with stress and anxiety. Yeah. Um, you know, and it's like it, you know, they don't make the numbers that they, that they wanted to today. They squat. Well, it's just, that's just a learning process yep. and, and also an acceptance, just like your genetics that, not every day is going to necessarily be a winner or not every week or even every month or even a three month phase where you just are feel like you're treading water. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that is going to be, that's going to happen with time. And, and part of the process is learning how to figure out what works for you, what doesn't work for you in terms of programming or exercise selection or technique or mm -hmm. whatever. Um, you got to learn to love the process and not these guys though. And I think the, the novice linear progression is it spoils them a little bit and, both the simplicity of it and the fact that it more or less works for everybody yep. and that they, they think that all training for the rest of their time under the bar is going to be like that. And if it's not, then that's something's wrong. Yep. But the re the reality is that's what makes this, the starting strength method work so well, but, but you have to realize again, like I said, at the beginning, it's the starting, starting strength right. method. It's Hence not your training program for, for life. And so, after that, things get a little bit more complicated, mm -hmm. okay, and they get a little bit slower. And there's periods of regression and movement forward, and all. And that's just that's just a part of the territory. But I think a lot of guys, especially when they don't have more context, like when I came in, when I came in and met Rip and kind of started learning about his methodology, I'd already spent years in the gym, mm -hmm. a lot of time in the gym, mm -hmm. and it the the starting strength method actually makes even more sense when you have that backdrop of context, but for a lot of guys now, because it's popular, they're coming, this is their first exposure to lifting. Mm. You know, they, they, they're getting a referral to a starting strength gym or a coach or whatever. They've never really lifted before, certainly not seriously. And so they get exposed to it. They make all this rapid progress and they think, well, the, the hell, this is like, this is how it should be. Mm. Like this is, but it's not how it should be. Nope. It's not, and it's not, or it's not how it is um, for most people. I always liken it to like, you know, we have, I, I, I do a lot of fishing and, you know, I, I use a, a, a couple of fishing guides here in the Texas coast and the Louisiana coast. And it's like, you know, every time I, I pay a lot of money, but every time I go out with them, we hammer them, you know, we do great. And it's like, if that's all that you ever did, you would think, well, that's what fishing is. You go out in the boat and you throw your line out there and you just start catching fish. Right. But if you've ever done it yourself and you had your own boat, and done, it's like you, you spend a whole lot of time <laughs> wasting time and not catching anything. And that's why a lot of people don't like it. That's the reason I started paying for it. Cause it's like, you know, but it kind of spoils you, right. It's just kind of the same thing. It's like you, you, if that's all that you ever did, you would think, well, that's, that's, this is what progress is. This is what lifting is. It's just constant movement forward. And it's, it's not. So if you don't, if you don't learn to love the process, um, and it's, again, it's kind of like fishing for me. It's like, even if I go out and we have a bad day, I still love it. I still love doing it. And it's like, even in the gym, if I go in and it's not the greatest day or I have a period of weeks or months where I'm not really moving the ball forward, it's like, I still love it, you know, and I still enjoy the process. And I think that more people need to adopt that mindset. And I think if you relax a little bit and learn and not give yourself fucking anxiety attacks over every time that you miss a rep or whatever, you'll actually probably make better progress. This is a long-term you know? thing. No need to beat yourself up over a thing. shitty week. Yeah, exactly. That's you know, the, the don't fishing. Like the, the exercise should be the exercise should be a a source of stress relief, not a source of stress. Right. And too many people make it; they make it a source of stress. Just relax. For no themselves, need to be rather than the about opposite. It. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. The the fishing guide uh, example is is a really good way to illustrate something I wanted to end on actually, which is go see someone like Andy, or go to one of our gyms, 
if you want to make gains and you want to demystify all this shit. Because the fishing guide yeah. knows the spot, knows what gear to yep. use, and knows the technique. And from A to Z, it's all mapped out. You're yep. going to have a good time and you're going to catch some fish. So, man, I wish that uh, starting strength coaches existed when I was 19 and I was wise enough and had enough uh, disposable cash to hire one because, my God, well, man, that would have saved it's me like 15 people... years of, of nonsense, right? So I, I tell people this all the time. It's like, so when people say, you know, well, well coaching so expensive or whatever, I say, yeah, it's a valuable asset that we have is time. And you're, when you're paying for coaching, yes, you're paying for expertise and, you know, guidance and all that sort of stuff, but you're paying, you're, you're, people, you're not just paying for that hour or that hour and a half with the coach. It's beyond that. You're paying to not waste months or years of your own time. Opportunity from the, from the client. Yes. For the, from the client standpoint, you know, do you want to waste the next couple of years or decade fucking around in the gym, or do you want to shorten that learning curve much more? So it's, you're not just paying for that hour session or whatever you're paying for your own time, shortening your learning curve, but you're also paying like for maybe the coach's time of making a lot of these mistakes on your behalf. You know what I mean? It's like, how, it's like the fishing guide, you know, how many, how many, hours did he spend out on the water not catching anything before he learned the patterns mm -hmm. before he learned where when when the wind is in this direction and the tide is here go here well in order to he didn't figure that out on day one he had to go to a ton of places over a long period of time to figure out where the fish are not right in order to figure out where they are and so you're when i pay that guide i'm not just paying for the six hours or whatever i'm out on the water with him i'm paying for my time so that i don't have to waste time figuring out all this shit on my, for myself for what for me is a hobby. Um, and I'm also paying him for his time of making a bunch of mistakes on my behalf that I don't now have to make. So it's, so when I look at it like that, I don't have, I don't have any problem forking over the money for what some people go, oh, you pay that much just to go fishing. And it's like, yeah, I, yeah. But it, for me, if I enjoy it and I want to get something out of it and I don't do it that often, um, I don't want to have a waste of time. And it's the same thing with coaching. It's like, if, if you're going to, if you're a busy guy, and you're, you're working hard at your job and you're trying to raise the family or whatever it is. And it's like, you want to get the most out of your three hours a week or whatever it is that, that you're doing. You know, it's like one of those things where you just, you don't want to, that's not time that you have the ability to waste. You can learn how to opinion. sing on your own, but if you hire a vocal coach, it'll be a much better experience. <laughs> right. So same deal. Exactly. If you're, I've, I've said it before. If you're cash rich and time poor, you hire professionals to help you accelerate. And if you're, exactly. uh, if you're cash poor and time rich, like the young men that we're talking to today, all the information is out there. It's all out there. You all just have there. to immerse yourself in it, get form checks, talk to professionals and do trial and error and try not to be too much of a knucklehead. And you will, uh, you will really enjoy the outcome. You'll get there. So Andy, um, I could talk to you for hours, man. And if, uh, if the people in the comments enjoy this and they let us know about that, then maybe we'll do another episode, but shit, we're over an hour and a half sure. in. So let's, let's wrap here. Um, there's a couple of cool. things I want to leave the audience with. So give me the name of that article you wrote the other day. Cause that was fantastic. Do you know offhand? Oh, shit. It was on rips. It was on startingstrength.com. Okay. Startingstrength.com. Uh, Just search Andy Baker. Think, it's his most recent article. Uh, in typical rip fashion, the, 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 the title that I submitted, he changed. Well, in, so, in his defense, he's a pretty good copywriter. I, no, I know, <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. And uh, and actually, and actually, he he, uh, I, I reread it after he edited it, and it was it was probably the least amount of um, least amount of changes he's ever made to an article that I submitted. So I was actually I was pretty happy with the article, but he did he changed the title, and I don't it's something hypertrophy related. Yeah. I don't remember, and it's, but it's or just muscular a, size or whatever. It's a really good review, Andy. I think you you nailed in that article, and one of the themes is that. Um, you know, there's a the theoretical shit, then there's the stuff we see in person, and the stuff we see in terms of outcomes is what matters, and we can argue all day about the theoretical shit, but ultimately, we know what works, so just yeah, take the we, we know method. what works, and there's a whole lot of other stuff around this that we don't, like, my opinion sometimes goes back and forth on it, because I, like, you, you read certain things about it, or you observe certain things about it, you observe them with yourself, you observe them with clients, and, you know, you read kind of the, 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 the uh, lab coat guys, the research guys, they're not real sure about some of this stuff, their opinions change or whatever, things like, you know, how much does say a, a muscular pump affect muscle growth? Is that causative or is it just, uh, is it just an indicator that, you know, there's lots of little things like that, that you can debate back and forth, whether, you know, how much of that stuff is, but what we do know is that is the performance part of it of, you know, 
uh, chasing a pump is not something that can be quantified and progressed over time. Right. And so, but, but raising the numbers on your lifts is, mm. and we do know that that is, that's the surefire way to get it done. And the other stuff is maybe yes, don't know changes over time. Like we're, we're not real sure, but what, so control the things that we do know, uh, that work. And at best, all of those other little things are going to be a very small percentage of whatever, you know, whatever gains you're going to get, they're only going to attribute like a, a tiny amount. It's like what I tell people about creatine. It's like, are you a fan of creatine? I, you know, I don't know it, it to whatever degree it's going to help. It's going to be marginal compared to your diet. I'm a fan so of I don't really want programming and good recovery. Right. right. And it's like, to, it's like, I, I'm, I don't really like people ask about creatine. I'm like, I don't really want to have this conversation until we know about, until your diet's fixed. Right. You know, people love to focus to that point, on the little a, things before getting right. the big building so at, blocks at, at, at best, creatine is a, a very small percentage of what ultimately your gains are going to come from. I mean, very, very small mm -hmm. compared to the training, the programming, and the diet. And it's the same thing with like a lot of these other things with the bodybuilding considerations. They're, they're such a small sliver of, of what whether they work or not is almost irrelevant. Even if they do, it's such a small sliver compared to the big rocks, which are the nutrition side of things and getting your numbers up. Yep. Exactly right. And then Andy, um, before we let everyone go, I want to make sure they can contact you. So what, what services are you offering? Are you still doing online coaching? I know you sell templates. Oh, what, yeah. do you wanna, yeah. what do you want to plug? All, all of the above. Um, so the best place to go. So actually my online coaching roster right now is full. Um, but I do have a thing where you can email me and I'll push you on a waiting list. Um, I take a lot of time with my online clients. And so I don't like to, I'm not one of these guys that has 200 online clients or 300 online clients. And then you know, emails everybody out the same template every week, which is what a lot of guys do. I take a lot of time with each individual person. So my roster's full right now. I can only take so many because also unlike a lot of other online coaches, I still coach every day in person at my gym. Um, that's still my full-time job. So um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm busy there, but I do have, I have an online uh, barbell club that people can sign up for, which is um, coaching and guidance. It's not a one-on-one -on -one type of thing. It's not as hands-on as my one-on-one -on -one thing, but it's a, it's a place where people can ask me questions. Um, nothing's off limits, whether it's strength training or powerlifting or bodybuilding or whatever. Um, I provide some t uh, templated programming with that. It's, it's, I always say it's not custom, but it's customizable. Mm. Um, and then, um, I've got, yeah, I also have templates available on the site, all that shit. It, just go to andybaker.com. Nice. And Andy same Baker thing. If you want to, if you, yeah, if you want to email me, just, uh, do it from the, from the website or from one of the contact forms on the website. And then also I want to plug my podcast, if yeah, you don't mind, please. which is a, a Baker barbell podcast and it's on uh, Spotify, Google, Apple, and Stitcher. I don't even know what Stitcher is, but we're on it. So, <laughs> and I think I've, I think I had to hire, uh, <laughs> before we got on, Ray goes, oh, you've got a microphone and a headset. You know what you're doing with this podcast stuff. I was like, I have no fucking idea what I'm doing. It's like, just, I have a I podcast. Hired a guy to Doesn't tell mean me what I know to, what I'm doing. <laughs> right. I know how to turn. I know how to turn the mic on and and put the headphones on, and that's that's about it. Other than yeah. that, when people were trying to get me to do a podcast, and I was like, the only way I'm going to do a podcast if if I don't have to do a goddamn thing except sit down and talk into the microphone. Yep. If I have to do anything other than that, I'm not doing it. So I found a guy that that handles all of it for me. So. It's uh, it's all, it's all good. And I'm having fun with it. Yeah. It's a Baker barbell podcast. Keep so it going. Go, man. Give it a, go give it a listen. Keep it going. Ina's one of your I, biggest fans, by the way, she sends me links to your podcast about once a week, you know, couple. Oh, good. Um, but yeah. man, uh, we're lucky, you know, there, there, there are plenty of coaches like me that have learned from guys like you and that's what enabled us to do our jobs. But then there are guys like you and guys like Rip who accumulated all this experience over all these decades. And lucky for us, you documented that stuff in written form. And now you guys are both doing podcasts and sharing the knowledge and, and it's free and man, I appreciate it. I know the, the rest of the guys that are watching this do too. So thanks for all that you do, man. Oh, cool. I appreciate it. And thanks for, thanks for the invite again. All right, Andy. See you, man. All right. Have Thanks. a good one.